welcome. And people, you can feel free to put things in chat too. And I can, I'll, I'll kind of monitor that because sometimes I know it's hard to see on full screen and, and I'll pause you if there's some questions in the chat that you haven't seen. That sounds great. That would be perfect. Um, so I, I'm going to focus today on U.S. healthcare reform and women, progress to date and unfinished business. Um, and a lot of this will kind of, I think, address some pediatric issues as well um, as we think about maternity care. So um, I, I know many of you, uh, but there are a few of you that are new faces. So I always just include this slide about um, where I came from and why I do the work that I do. And I did residency at the University of Pittsburgh at McGee Women's Hospital and had the privilege of taking care of um, uh, a largely lower income, underserved urban population. And it really planted a lot of seeds about injustices in our healthcare system. And I came here to Michigan only for a two-year health services research fellowship. <laughs> and then here I am uh, quite a few years later. I joined faculty in 2015 and uh, have, have been so fortunate to build a fantastic mentorship team. And I am currently funded on a K award through uh, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. And I have just loved being a member of IHPI and serve as the early chair for another and it's been a real privilege to represent our over 200 members in that. A lot of work with our power group, the Research, um, which is our health services research group in the department of OBGYN. So I'm really excited to be here talking with all of you today about um, some of my research. So uh, as Sarah mentioned, my research goal is to try to translate evidence into reproductive health policy and practice in order to improve women's health outcomes and eliminate inequities in our field. And on the policy side, my work has really focused on the ACA and its effects on women. And that's really where the meat of the talk will be today. My, on the practice side, my, my K-funded research has looked at postpartum contraception, how we can implement evidence-based guidelines for, for care. And um, more recently with one of my amazing colleagues and mentees, Alex Peel, we're looking at how to redesign prenatal care in this country. So excited to share some things along the way um, from, from, uh, from that work as well as the more policy focused work. So my outline for the talk here today is really about um, what, what healthcare looks like for women before the ACA, what changed with the ACA in terms of policies and, and what the downstream effects were for women in terms of coverage, affordability, and then utilization and health outcomes. And then we'll wrap it up by talking very briefly about unfinished business and what some potential next steps might be. So for women in the pre-ACA era, um, women faced many unique challenges uh, because more women work part-time or um, are, are uh, working without compensation in the home, um, women have less access to employer-based insurance. Um, women are also more likely to be covered as dependents. And so women are more vulnerable to health insurance loss. For example, if their spouse loses a job or um, in the case of divorce. Women also get paid less for the same work on average, um, making lower incomes than men and uh, have greater need for healthcare services. And so are, are therefore more vulnerable to out-of-pocket costs for healthcare. And insurance policy certainly didn't make it easy for women in this pre-ACA era. Women could be denied coverage for pre-existing conditions such as pregnancy, infertility, intimate partner violence, um, very common conditions. Women could also be charged higher premiums due to gender rating. There's a really fascinating um, white paper out of the National Women's Law Center that estimates that in aggregate, women paid annually an extra $1 billion because of this policy of gender rating before the ACA. Um, needed services such as maternity care were often excluded from plans. Um, women also had a lot of insurance churn uh, before uh, during and after pregnancies. And there were really striking racial, ethnic, and income-based disparities in uninsurance rates. And, and the ACA set out to fix some of this. As this audience knows really well, one of the big goals of the ACA was coverage, trying to enhance the number of folks who were covered through a blend of, of um, private and public um, insurance reforms. 
There was also work to be done on affordability. So once folks had coverage, can we try to make sure that their, their spending for healthcare is lower than it was in the pre-ACA era? And through both of those avenues, could we have downstream effects on utilization and health outcomes? So let's talk some yeah, about, right. about some specific, sorry, Sarah, were you saying something? Nope. Okay. okay. Um, I'll just kind of dive in here and talk a little bit in a little bit more detail about some of the major policy changes that may have affected women in each of these realms. So in terms of coverage, um, of course, Medicaid expansion, um, offering subsidies uh, for premiums and cost sharing subsidies um, for those enrolling in marketplace plans, the dependent coverage provision allowing young adults to stay on their health and parents health insurance plans up to age 26 and then bans on pre-existing conditions from excluding coverage. On the affordability side, the major policy, policy changes included bans on gender rating and on annual and lifetime spending caps by plans, and then a variety of consumer protections, including requiring plans to cover essential health benefits and maternity care is included under the essential health benefit clause, and then the preventive services clause, which required a number of services that were determined by a variety of expert national committees um, to be covered at first dollar, so without cost sharing. So what happened based on these policies? So in terms of coverage, I think there were some really notable successes of, of the ACA. So rates of uninsured women ages 18 to 64 fell by 39% from 18% in 2007 down to 11% in 2017. So this was a big win. And when we start to break out those numbers, um, you can see that the, the bigger picture shift um, was in large part driven by um, this coverage for, for dependents. Young adults were a group that had very high rates of uninsurance and, and that those rates fell really remarkably with the ACA. And then also lower income women. So those who may have qualified for Medicaid expansions and, and those who may have benefited from some of those policies affecting the commercial market. Interestingly, um, we still have really striking variation in coverage for women across um, our country. Not all states have expanded Medicaid. And so you can see this really, um, really profound variation with 3% of women uninsured in, in states like Massachusetts and DC and, DC, and um, rates as high as 23% in other parts of our country. So a little more work to be done here. And there are also disparities in coverage by race, ethnicity, and by citizenship status. Um, you can see that, that although um, uh, uh, white folks are, are covered at, at pretty high rates, um, many other groups across our population do not have coverage rates that um, are as notable, and we have a lot of work to do in this space. And similarly, those living in the United States who are not citizens have very high rates of uninsured status. So, so our, our policies haven't benefited everybody equally. Um, this is some work by my amazing colleague, Dr. Lindsay Admin. Uh, I mentioned that women have very high rates of perinatal insurance churn. About 50% of women in both commercial and Medicaid plans um, had a change in insurance coverage at some point during their pregnancy or that first six months postpartum. And um, Lindsay's work demonstrates that in states that expanded Medicaid, we see a bit of an improvement in, in, in um, these, these rates of churn. I would argue these rates are still really high. <laughs> we still have um, work to do, but this is a notable benefit of Medicaid expansion. Um, we also know that uninsurance rates are falling among postpartum women, um, and that is a really reassuring trend that we've seen because of the ACA. And as you guys know really well, there's a big gap in coverage when you go from pregnancy to being a parent. So um, the blue bars here are the income thresholds for Medicaid coverage for pregnant women. And the orange bars are the same thresholds for coverage of parents. And you can see that these really striking gaps. Um, so it's easy to imagine how folks are um, losing that coverage postpartum. Many states are trying to deal with this by um, uh, thinking about ways to extend postpartum coverage for a full year after childbirth. And these, these are in the works. We'll see um, how this policy landscape continues to change over time. 
So key takeaways about coverage, we've seen really important wins, some large reductions in uninsurance rates among working age women and some key subpopulations, but still lots of work to do, focusing on equity and, and thinking about policies that really center the needs of the groups that are currently the most marginalized. So what about affordability? What do we know about effects of the ACI on financial hardships? So, so um, the experience of um, out-of-pocket costs that, that patients may feel. And what do we know about actual spending, the quanti quantified out-of-pocket costs? So in terms of affordability, these are um, all of the studies here at the bottom are diff and diff analyses of the National Health Interview Study, um, BRFSS, or other um, large uh, survey studies. And um, they all document some impressive reductions in health-related financial hardship among women overall, with folks reporting less difficulty finding affordable coverage, um, fewer folks are worrying about paying for care with notable effects on specialty care and prescription drugs, fewer folks report cost-related unmet health healthcare needs, so delaying or deferring care due to cost, and fewer folks are having problems paying medical bills. We know that medical bills are a major driver of bankruptcy in this country, so that is a reassuring finding. Um, our team is doing a little bit of work now led by um, one of our fantastic general surgery residents who's doing her uh, two-year research fellowship, Dr. Catherine Taylor, and she's done this preliminary analysis looking at the National Health Interview Survey and um, has looked at unmet need, unaffordable healthcare, and general financial stress among peripartum women. And these are um, the kind of trends over time from 2013 to 2018. The y-axis is percent from zero to 100. And the green bars are those who are uninsured. The yellow bars are those with private health insurance. And the blue bars are those with public or other insurance coverage. And there's a couple important things to note. Um, the uninsured group has the highest rates of all, of all of these indicators of financial hardship. They're also by far the smallest group. The vast majority of folks fall into the yellow or the blue lines. Um, and and uh, interestingly, these lines aren't really changing much over time. That was a bit of a surprise to us. We thought with um, all of the policies I've just, just described that there may have been some movement in these lines and we're really not seeing um, a lot of change over time here. I was also really interested in the middle figure here. Um, I think seeing this yellow line sort of flip to be on top and, and folks with private insurance coverage are reporting much higher rates of unaffordable health care. We think this is potentially related to out-of-pocket costs, and I'll show you some data on that in a minute. Um, the other take-home point, I think, is that we're seeing lots of indicators of financial hardship in, in this group of growing families. Um, that general financial stress line is pretty high as well, and so thinking about policies that maybe aren't specifically health policies, but other policies that are needed to affect the economic security um, of families. So, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about out-of-pocket costs. So um, the ACA is preventing- Michelle, yes. can I ask a question? Do you mind taking sure. questions? In Please. Between? Okay, great. First of all, good morning. It's really nice to have you here. On the previous slide, um, yeah. I did have a question. So, so you're looking at these stratified, but kind of the, um, you know, the overall impact of the ACA um, was most likely to move people um, between these groups. And so you've got different sizes of um, women in each of these groups, both you know, before and after the implementation of the ACA. And so if you looked at um, the combined um, group, does it look the same or different? Um, that is a good question. I am not sure. I'd have to go back. That is, that's a great question. And I can report back to you, see what we that's find. Great. So that'd be really interesting. Thanks. Okay, so shifting gears a little bit, just to think about um, preventive services. Um, the ACA required that services that were given a um, USPSTF rating of A or B, services recommended by um, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, and services identified by HRSA's um, uh, Women's Preventive Services Task Force, um, that these services be covered out of without out-of-pocket costs. 
And contraception is on this list, a few other things, and um, I'll talk a little bit about what we saw. So um, this is a, a paper published by another of our amazing colleagues, a general internist and health economist, Dr. Nora Becker. And her um, uh, paper suggested that women saw really rapid and large decreases in out-of-pocket spending for contraception. There are very similar studies documenting um, a fall in out-of-pocket spending for mammography, health maintenance exams. Um, and this is a, a paper led by my mentor and colleague, Dr. Vanessa Dalton, showing um, what these trends looked like. So you can see this really um, quick drop all the way down to a median out-of-pocket cost of zero for preventive care office visits and for LARC long-acting reversible contraceptive initiation. And the gray shading in, in the back of the graph is the proportion of women that went to having no out-of-pocket costs. You can see that that shift happened very quickly. Um, interestingly, though, our work has shown that not all populations um, uh, I should say that, that maybe more policy work is needed. So we looked at maternity care, which is covered under the ACA as an essential health benefit, not a preventive service. So um, first dollar coverage is not required. Plans have to cover maternity care, but they are allowed to impose out-of-pocket costs through cost sharing, deductibles, and coinsurance. And we looked at um, United Health Insurance beneficiaries from 2008 to 2015. And this is what we found. Um, out-of-pocket spending on maternity care. So this is looking just at pregnancy and childbirth, just mom's expenses, not including baby's expenses. Um, and we found that spending of some kind was nearly universal. And that mean total out-of-pocket spending increased from a little over $3,000 to, to a little over $4,500 in, in a relatively short time span um, in, ending in, in 2015. When you look at these lines here, the top teal line here is total, and the yellow line is coinsurance. The reddish orange line is deductibles and, and the bottom darker tail line is co-payments. And you can see it's really the deductibles that are driving this trend that we're seeing. The study really resonated with people. It was um, covered a lot in the, in the lay press. I think people were um, just really surprised and indignant that, that families would be paying this much out of pocket for a very common um, service. This is in fact the most common reason that um, women utilize a healthcare plan is for having a baby. Um, and we are following up this work with um, some really interesting analyses led um, by Cao Ping Chua. Um, Cao, if you want to chime in, feel free. I don't want to step on your toes here. <laughs> Um, but uh, uh, Cal has found, um, uh, looking again at Optum data, that, that when you look at spending for the childbirth hospitalization and look at the true family expense, which is cost for both mom and for baby, um, look at out and look at out-of-pocket spending. The spending just for that hospital stay, the median total is, is a little over $3,000. Again, non-zero for almost everybody. One in six families are paying more than $5,000 and, and the median is about 5,000 for those who ha have neonatal intensive care required during their hospital stay. Um, uh, with just these, these really interesting differences based on whether or not you have a cesarean and whether or not you need neonatal intensive care. So um, this was the first try examination to try to understand that, that true family cost of both for both mom and for baby. And Cal followed this up with um, a related analysis looking at surprise bills for childbirth. So one in five families with in-network deliveries in 2019 in this same um, sample of United enrollees had potential surprise bills with a median cost of $744, but with one in three families having liability over $2,000. Hopefully, with new recent policy changes, these surprise bills are going to go away. So this will be something to, to watch um, closely in the next year or two. I think one of the take home messages is that we still have a lot more work to do, um, despite some of the improvements in preventive services coverage. When you look at out of pocket costs overall, the United States and Switzerland are real outliers among um, uh, highly resourced countries in terms of what women are spending out of pocket. Um, so with 26% of our population of women um, of working age spending $2,000 or more annually on, on their healthcare. 
We also know that out-of-pocket costs are not the only expense that families may have for healthcare. Families are also facing rising premium costs with the average premiums for family coverage increasing by 55% over the last decade. So this is clearly an issue that's affecting people's pocketbooks. So my takeaways are we've seen some really important reductions in financial hardship due to healthcare, unmet healthcare needs, and cost sharing for routine recommended preventive care, which should help women access these evidence-based recommended services. But there are growing concerns about financial protections for working families with employer-based insurance due to really high costs for common events like childbirth and due to rising premiums for healthcare overall. So with what we've just talked about related to coverage and affordability, what do we know about utilization and health outcomes? So this was um, a paper that we did with quite a few colleagues here at, um, at uh, IHPI. Um, I was really lucky to be brought on to the Healthy Michigan Plan Evaluation Team to collaborate on this project. And we um, uh, asked folks who recently enrolled in, um, uh, in the HMP plan about what happened to their access to family planning and contraceptive care when they enrolled. And 36% of new enrollees reported improved access to these services. Those at a younger age and with, uh, with, um, who had previously been uninsured and those who had recently visited a primary care doctor were more likely to report higher access. So some really great positive findings suggesting that Medicaid expansion may help folks be able to access family planning care. We've also looked at um, contraception and employer-based insurance. I mentioned Nora Becker's study showing that, that fall and out-of-pocket costs for contraception. There are great follow-up studies that, that have shown that that fall and out-of-pocket cost was associated perhaps unsurprisingly with increased use of contraception, increased use of the most effective methods, including methods like IUDs and implants, which are highly effective, but also have very high cost barriers. Um, they're about $800 to purchase um, uh, for a healthcare you know, or, organization to purchase to provide to patients. So they're not cheap upfront. And this fall in out-of-pocket costs, um, there, there's a new paper uh, that Dr. Dalton led showing reduced income-related disparities and in unintended birth rates. So we think folks um, for whom out-of-pocket costs were functioning as a barrier to utilizing their preferred highly effective method may have really benefited in particular from this policy to remove cost sharing um, in terms of preventing unintended births. We don't yet know if this rise in contraceptive use will affect maternal and neonatal outcomes with more pregnancies that are planned, potentially um, healthier birth spacing. So that remains to be seen and effects on abortion rates are also unknown at this time. So jury's still out. We have a little more work to do to try to push, uh, push that work forward. Um, but like with coverage and affordability, our current policies don't seem to be working for everyone. And postpartum women, seem to be a group that, that isn't really benefiting from this policy. So this is a bit of a busy figure. Um, the, first, uh, the first set of, bar, of, of um, lines are women in plans with no cost sharing um, for LARC devices. The middle is women in plans with low cost sharing, less than $200. And on, on the far right is women in plans with high cost sharing for LARC methods. We focused on cost sharing for LARC methods because of, of um, that data I had shown you previously um, where that documented that out-of-pocket costs for many contraceptives really fell quite precipitously. Um, and in fact, before the ACA was rather low. LARC was really the category of contraception that had this pre that this pre-existing financial barrier. And what we found was that women who were in plans without cost sharing had much higher rates of utilization of LARC. That's that teal line, the third line from the bottom in these figures. And you can see that it's higher than in women, even those with low cost sharing. This was a surprise to us. We, we did, prior literature suggested that $200 is kind of the cost sharing threshold for LARC use, but postpartum women appear to be sensitive even to lower amounts of cost sharing in terms of their utilization. And the other interesting finding was that um, uh, the, the other line that looks different is the yellow line, those with no prescription method observed. So when, you when um, women are exposed to cost sharing in that postpartum period, 
what uh, those who may otherwise use utilize LARC seem to instead be utilizing no prescription method um, when they don't have a, a, as unconstrained access to LARC methods. So um, instead, it's this is not a shift to sterilization or other hormonal methods that are relatively effective. Um, we're really seeing that women who may otherwise utilize LARC are using no prescription method. Um, in terms of perinatal outcomes, there is some just very scant emerging literature suggesting that the ACA has documented, ha has led to improved use of recommended screening early in pregnancy, um, increased use of maternal postpartum services, and potentially greater reductions in infant mortality in states that have expanded Medicaid. Um, we have not seen changes in preterm birth or low birth weight, although there have been some narrowing and disparities in, in um, black and white rates of low birth weight. And um, there seem to be some improvements in preterm birth rates among dependents. And you guys probably know that literature even better than I do. So feel free to chime in if anybody wants to add anything. Um, there have also been some emerging studies looking at other healthcare services with mixed results on screening, cervical cancer, breast cancer, um, other gynecologic cancers. And, and part of this may be that um, for many screening tests, the first step in screening is covered, but subsequent steps in screening are not covered um, at first dollar. So for example, pap smears are covered, but if your pap smear or your HPV test is abnormal and we recommend a colposcopy or a biopsy, those services are not covered without cost sharing. And similarly, breast cancer screening, um, there's some really great work led by Ruth Carlos in our Department of Radiology showing that a screening mammogram is covered, but if you need diagnostic imaging or a biopsy, those things are not covered first dollar. And so um, that may be part of why we're seeing some of these mixed effects um, in terms of the ACA and utilization of recommended screening services. We have seen an increase in early stage cancer diagnosis. So that does suggest some downstream benefit of um, these cancer screening policies, policies to cover recommended cancer screening tests. In terms of mental health, there are some uh, emerging data suggesting that the ACA may be associated with higher rates of screening for mental health conditions among adults um, with improved symptomatology and, and um, uh, fewer, with fewer folks reporting unmet mental health needs. I should mention that many of these studies are not sex disaggregated. So these, this really is just an a, 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 a embryonic literature that hopefully will grow over time. We have seen some improvements in diagnosis of chronic diseases um, uh, and, and potentially some improvements in overall mortality. In terms of self-reported health, we've seen substantial improvements for young adults. We'll have to see if the pandemic changes some of those trends. Um, we've seen more mixed changes in self-reported health for Medicaid enrollees. And again, very few studies are helping us to understand whether there are differences across populations. So um, in terms of race, race ethnicity, for example, I, I, this, um, this paper in Health Affairs, it represents findings from 19 different studies and very few looked at differences in outcomes by race and ethnicity. So there's clearly more work to do in that space. So my key takeaways related to utilization and health we saw some really positive improvements for some population health outcomes, but we really don't know very much yet about the long-term effects on health outcomes and in particular health inequities. We have some more work to do there. So unfinished business of, of the ACA. I think, you know, when I sort of step back and think about all of this data together, um, I think these are our, our three key goals. One is to really reduce variation in effective policies. Um, we're at a point now where we have some great data about things that work, and we have to make sure that those policies are being extended to, to everybody, making sure everybody's benefiting. Um, I think we need some very intentional efforts to promote equity and reproductive justice. Reproductive justice is a framework and a movement that was um, founded uh, and, and is currently led by Black women and other women of color. And, and the premise of reproductive justice 
is that all people should be able to decide whether and when to have children and to parent with dignity, to parent children in a safe um, uh, and, and um, healthy environment. And I think we have a lot of work to do to continue promoting policies in that, in that space and um, clinical care delivery pivots to really allow us to do that well. So in our own work, for example, we've done a lot of work looking at access to contraception. And I think the field of family planning is um, really rapidly evolving in its thinking about contraceptive use and, and with a, a robust growing recognition that um, our work cannot focus just on access. We also have to focus on the patient experience of care and thinking about patient reported outcomes as equally important as contraceptive access and utilization outcomes. So that's one example from our fields, but I think um, you know this, this work to enhance patient centeredness um, really aligns well with this national conversation we are having about systemic racism in this country. Um, and then I think there's the third bucket of work is uh, more robust research on the on downstream effects on health outcomes. We've seen kind of these preliminary studies looking at access and um, coverage and affordability. And now we really need much more robust studies that look at particular segments of our populations to really understand and kind of ferret out potential inequities that, so that we know where to focus our efforts to make sure that um, everyone's benefiting equally in terms of health outcomes. So that's my last slide. And I would be so happy to, to um, answer questions or um, just in, engage in a discussion with all of you about um, these, some of these findings and how this aligns or, or differs from um, some of the populations that you all are studying and thinking about right now. Great. Thanks, Michelle, so much. That was really a tremendous presentation and with lots of I think, sobering findings as well. Um, so one question, um, you know, as we all think about moving forward with trying to understand disparities and then with an eye towards eventually addressing those inequities, um, you know, the data sets you know, that, that you've used in your research that you just presented are typically um, large, or some of them are at least administrative data sets that don't um, have very good characterization of race and ethnicity or other markers um, of um, marginalized groups that we might want to study. And I wonder if you might want to comment on that and just, um, you know, so that we can think collectively about how to move the field forward in that space, because I think that's going to be an ongoing challenge for all of us. Yeah, I, that is a, such a good question. I don't know that I have um, an answer. That's a bit, it's a big problem. Well, I was I think, hoping. I do think we're, we're at a place where we have a little bit of leverage as a health community to be able to advocate for better data, to try to, to um, you know, for example, just locally here in Michigan, we have great relationships with Blue Cross Blue Shields. Could we be mm -hmm. working on advocating for mm -hmm. more robust collection of that data? Many of us use um, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield claims data um, provided through the CQIs. Um, I think you know we have an opportunity for some of those conversations with our colleagues in, at um, the state working on Medicaid as well. And so um, I think yeah. trying to use our um, expertise to advocate for better data is an important, really important avenue. I think the other piece of it is um, making sure that marginalized groups are at the table as we are thinking about designing our research questions, figuring out which projects to focus on. I think that stakeholder engagement piece is often done in a marginal way, is an afterthought. Um, but really kind of getting folks at the table to help us think about, you know, there are only so many hours in the week. What are the most pressing issues for you, for your community, for your family? Um, and, and letting that, those kinds of conversations help guide um, where we focus our efforts. I think it doesn't address the gaps in the data sets, um, but I think that's a really important piece. And, and the last part I would add sort of um, related to, to listening to our patients 
projects is that um, I, we all love our quantitative projects. In some ways, they are they're clean and objective and easy in, in a way. But I think we have to be willing to do the qualitative work because that's really where we unearth how people are experiencing our healthcare system, our policies, healthcare delivery at the front lines. Um, and, and I think that's where the innovation is going to come. To, to really, you know, lead to those solutions. So you mentioned, Lisa, this sort of dual work of understanding the problems and driving interventions. And I think we're at a point where we probably don't need too much more like understanding the problem work. We really need to be shifting towards the intervention work. And I think having, um, having patient voices is going to be critical for that. Thank you. Thanks. Hey, Michelle, um, that great talk. Uh, I really like the part uh, where you presented my research. That was my favorite part of the presentation. I'm just kidding. Um, Thanks, Cal. But, um, so uh, my question is, um, it actually is relevant to that comment. Um, so sometimes I feel like when, when you do research on access and affordability, it's always the same message. It's like, the US healthcare system sucks, basically. We don't have universal coverage, and even among those with coverage are, you know, the, the amount of the amount of under coverage, you know, um, is is large and that so it gets frustrating sometimes to write that over and over and over. Um, that essentially we're just pointing out the obvious in, in some ways that uh, this isn't so much like how do we get to better access and better better. Uh, it's just a matter of political will um, right it's just it's and that's part of the reason why. Um, I guess at some point in my life when I was I was evaluating the ACA and coverage expansions and stuff like that, I did my dissertation, part of my dissertation was on that, and then I just kind of <laughs> drifted a little bit away because I thought that, um, I don't know, like it, it just felt like the answer was obvious, universal health care, you know, so I, I, I don't know if you, you feel that way, I mean, obviously there is a, there's a role for obviously, um, you know, um, documenting the, the, the effects of expand of insurance expansions in order to generate the political will. I mean, obviously I think that that's part of the answer, but does it does it ever feel frustrating to you um, that we feel it, it's just we're saying the same thing over and over? Yeah, of course. Uh, um, absolutely. Um, but I, I also think part of that um, not everybody buys into the same belief system maybe that we have about health as a human right and, and the need to promote access to care. Um, the ACA has been challenged, continues to be challenged um, in our court system, right? And even a decade later. And so um, I think we very much have work to do to build, to build that political will. And data is very powerful. So, um, you know, the I, our shared colleague, Mark Fendrick, has, has taken a he's really built a career out of taking the numbers we generate and putting them in front of policymakers to say, can you believe this? We have to fix this. And, and that data is such a powerful tool. So I would say, yes, I do get tired sometimes, but um, I think we have to continue in, in the relentless pursuit of a more universal, more equitable system. And we have the benefit of social capital and we have to use it. We are, you know, as, as physicians and other folks within our healthcare system, um, we have to use that social capital for good to advocate for folks who are not currently benefiting from our policies and our practice. So when on the days when when I, I feel fatigued, I just I try to come back to that um, that sense of passion and and just knowing that the work we do is meaningful and, and the steps forward may be incremental, um, and that part may be frustrating, but that work is so important. We have to keep fighting. I think it might also be an interest um, if you, if you could talk a little bit about that new the new CQI that you are leading um, on maternity health. I think that would be great. Sure, sure. So um, I'm not sure how familiar folks are with the CQI. So I'll give you a quick overview. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield um, 
withholds a little bit of, of the money that physicians might otherwise be paid through like the physician payment schedule. They kind of put it in reserve and put it back into the provider community through these statewide collaborative quality initiatives or CQIs. Um, there are more than 20 of them at this point. Um, a couple new ones have been funded in the last six months. So I'm not, I can't recall the exact number. I think it's up to about 25 CQIs now. And they're typically run by health services researchers at the University of Michigan, and their membership includes various um, organizations across the state. Many of the CQIs are hospital-based, and they're focused on a specific episode of care. So often, a you know, bariatric surgery or the delivery hospitalization for childbirth um, or other um, kind of discrete episodes of care like that. Um, there are other CQIs that are a, a little more focused on ambulatory care, and I think that's kind of where the CQIs are going at this point, is starting to think a little bit more about population health outcomes and health equity. And then there are a few new CQIs that are meant to be focused on the CQIs themselves. So um, these newer CQIs are going to almost serve as resources to the other CQIs to roll out initiatives across the CQIs. So um, Tammy Chang is running a CQI called HBOM, Health Behavior Optimization in Michigan, that's gonna focus on tobacco cessation, diet, and exercise. Um, John Scott and Renu Tipernini are running a CQI called M-Shield, which is working on building robust mechanisms to measure social determinants of health and to, to um, match folks who have unmet social needs related to housing, food insecurity, et cetera, um, with community organizations that can help meet those needs and to kind of bake that into our daily operations um, so that the measurement of social need is kind of like a vital sign in our healthcare system. So that work is ongoing and is hopefully going to disseminate across all of the CQIs. And um, we recently put in a proposal to Blue Cross to build a new CQI focused on ambulatory women's health care across the lifespan with a goal of addressing things like um, chronic diseases that chronic disease risk that first presents in pregnancy. So for example, a healthy woman that newly acquires gestational diabetes. Now we know that person has a 50% lifetime risk of type 2 diabetes. So what are we going to do about that? So that is an example of one area we want to focus in. Another area is preventive services, increasing use of recommended services like STI screening, um, access and, and use of contraception, and improving the patient experience of contraceptive care. And then the third bucket um, of work we want to focus on has to do with more acute gynecologic complaints that develop across the lifespan. So um, pelvic organ prolapse, incontinence, um, and, and uh, other conditions that where there's kind of a range of management options from low intensity um, outpatient medications um, uh, all the way up to kind of more acute surgical interventions. And so I'm um, trying to think about how to maximize the value of that care that's delivered in that context where um, there are multiple options at the table with really different costs and, and value delivered and patient preferences need to be part of the decision making. So the CQIs are kind of an interesting space where you have access to claims data. Sometimes there's a clinical registry that provides um, uh, additional data. There may be patient surveys that are administered, so you may have that kind of data as well. Um, and there's an increasing focus on collecting patient reported outcomes um, in terms of symptoms as well as the experience of care. So we'll see what happens. And we haven't been funded yet, but um, we're hopeful that that might be something that we have the privilege to tackle um, with a goal of recruiting about 300 clinics and about 1,000 OBGYNs across the state of Michigan. And I, I in my non-policy work, I do a bit of implementation science. And so this is kind of a fun implementation laboratory to really think about. We have all these national guidelines, but folks may not actually be delivering the care that we recommend. So what is needed to actually bake evidence um, into the care that we deliver across um, a state where there's variation in population served, variation in clinical sites, the culture at those sites, the types of providers working at those sites. So really kind of leaning into some of that variation to understand um, how we can best implement best practices for women's health care. Thanks for that question, Cal.
I have a question for uh, Dr. Moniz and uh, potentially Cow as well. Uh, so I'm a cheer fellow and a pediatric intensivist, and I the financial toxicity uh, work that you've done is really interesting. And I, I've talked with Aaron, who's on the call as well, who's another pediatric intensivist, about ways that we can look at this in a PICU population. And I think one thing that stands out to me in looking at your the out-of-pocket spending in uh, uh, like childbirth costs is that you know, for a family that almost you have like time to prepare, you have at least 23 weeks in general to think about and prepare for those out of pocket costs. And then in seeing that figure from Cal's paper of having the like NICU costs and how it's even more so of whether the like planning factor makes the like it almost fe seems like it would be kind of a uh, like exponentiating variable of, you know, like the, it's a, it increased costs and being able to un not plan for that. Like, I don't think many families will plan for their NICU admission of whether that seems like that could be potentially something that is kind of uh, increases the, the financial toxicity on a family. Yeah, that, that's a great question and is something we're hoping to look at. I mean, our work to date has really been quantifying these out-of-pocket costs, um, but we have an ROM proposal and we'll see what happens, fingers crossed, um, but we would we are going to have access to Blue Cross Blue Shield data that's linked to credit score data. And so we can start to think about exactly what you're asking about, which is like what happens to people's pocketbooks when they have this kind of financial shock. Um, and John Scott is doing this work in cohorts of trauma patients. And you know, if you think about like trauma, sort of the the financial trigger, you know, for, for um, working adults, particularly men who are at higher risk for, for needing a trauma surgery, childbirth is sort of the analog for healthy women, right? <laughs> um, maybe a little more planned than trauma. Um, but there are really interesting potential effects on people's credit scores, on, you know, whether they're in debt, how long it takes them to come out of that and, and recover after a big financial hit like this. Um, I, I don't know any literature on planning and, and whether being able to plan ahead is helpful or not. I, I, I wonder if maybe it, it doesn't um, have as profound of an effect as we might think um, because it assumes that folks are um, uh, able to change their circumstances. And I think for many folks, um, they maybe there isn't a lot of kind of buffer in, in, in the income coming in and ability to save any more than they may already be saving. So I, I, am, I, I suspect there would be really interesting differences by income um, in the answer to that question. Cal, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably worth uh, counseling people to save money before childbirth. Um, but at the end of the day, if you you got what you got, right? Um, you know, that, that that assumes that you have the ability to essentially save extra, you know, to cut down on your whatever bill so that you have a little extra when it comes, when child care comes. It also assumes that you understand what the uh, cost sharing mechanisms are, which the vast majority of people do not. And even I who study this sometimes don't get it. <laughs> I'm like, you know, it's, it's, it's incredibly obtuse. You don't have any way of predicting in advance you have you have some sense that okay at a minimum I'm probably if all goes well I will probably be hospitalized as a mother for you know one to two days my baby will probably be hospitalized along with me for one to two days uh, but if you know you know what hits the fan right and there's a some sort of complication I can't expect that you know if baby ends up uh, needing to be has meconium and needs to be intubated. Uh, it goes to the NICU for God knows how long, right? I mean, then, you know, you just can't, you can't predict for it. You can't, you can't do anything about that. Um, and I, I, so I'm, I'm pess. <laughs> I think that there's, the, you know, again, it goes back to that idea of like, yeah, there's some band-aid things that we can do, right? Um, that, yeah, I would like to say, okay, I want to do something about this problem because I know that this is going to throw some people into um, financial heck. But um, at the end of the day, we shouldn't be putting people in that position, um, you know, in the first place. Um, because right, right, as, at the end of the day, right, what, what is the purpose of, the, of, of imposing that cost sharing in the first place? There is none other than penalizing people for getting sick. sick. It's, it doesn't increase the efficiency of healthcare. It doesn't dissuade people from using, you know, using low value care, right? You can't, you can't predict whether your baby is gonna get intubated, right? So ultimately it's just bad luck. Um, and, 
It's also uh, compounded by the fact that if you are not in a superstar uh, health insurance plan, that you know that maybe <laughs> they might cover it for a two hundred fifty dollars copay if you're lucky. Um, but if you're in any other sort of healthcare plan, um, most of them probably don't have that level of coverage. I think there's also Lisa brought up the great point that 45% of pregnancies are unplanned in this country. We're making some progress on that number. It's still obviously way too high. Um, but additionally, families aren't just planning for the their health care. They may be, you know, uh, purchasing a house around this time. They are planning for child care expenses, which are not covered in any way in this country. They don't have, most people do not have paid parental leave. So um, women uh, in particular are making difficult decisions about, you know, potentially loss of income right around the same time as this healthcare cost is hitting. So there are all of these different forces coming together. And I think, you know, we're, we're starting to have a conversation in this country about what kind of society do we want to live in? As Cal mentioned, do we want to live in a society where um, some families are, you know, kind of punished with these costs without any expectation of change in healthcare behavior. There really isn't good rationale for the way the system is set up. Um, and so I think trying to elevate that perspective, because I think there are many folks who think, oh, it's an essential health benefit, it's covered, not realizing that it's not required to be covered at first dollar and what that translates to for families. On that note, um, I always make sure that we end about five minutes early. Um, in, Usually we stay on just in case there's any additional questions, but here, here is everyone's, it's okay to leave now if you'd like a break before your next meeting morning. Um, Michelle, thank you so much for joining us and for that really great presentation. I think that, um, you know, when we think about health services research and cheer and the different things we do that, you know, as we move to more towards a lifespan view, right? None of these things are, are independent that I think that a lot of these, these issues are, ones that we should all keep considering in, in our research. And it's just, yeah, there's a lot of work to do so, still. So thank you for your work on this and trying to um, bring equity for more women. And um, we'll, st we'll keep it open for about five more minutes if anyone has questions, but thank you for joining us today. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for having me. And thanks for this.